Gene Appelin is a Haitian-American citizen who literally danced his way out of a death sentence from Haiti to America when he was 16 years old after his father was killed for his political activities in Haiti. He eventually got a scholarship to the Alvin Ailey Dance Troupe in New York and danced with the Joffrey Ballet Company. He now manages J.E. Expressions Dance Troupe for both youth in Boston and in Haiti. Gene appeared on our show back in April to discuss his immigration story, which was quite amazing. This summer, Gene went back to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, directing his free annual Summer Dance Institute that serves young, aspiring Haitian dancers who do not have a regular access to dance education. When the classes were interrupted by deadly riots that broke out across the city on July 7th, Gene is back with me today to discuss his experience in Haiti this summer. He posted a lot on his Facebook page. Welcome back, Gene. It's a pleasure to have you. And I see you're driving, so I appreciate you, I guess, pulling over to the side of the road and giving us a few minutes. Thank you so much, Brad. I'm safe and far. Good, good. So you were in Haiti this summer, and you've been going back year after year, people who remember you from our April show. Uh, and you do this annual dance workshop. You do it for free. You open up your dance studio in Haiti, give your services. Everything is for free to help children who are impoverished, who don't have access to dance, the ability to try to achieve their dreams like you have. How is that going there? Uh, this is going pretty pretty well, except, you know, we definitely need a few hands, you know, to help us move forward and a few angels. But it's going well because we serve now around 100 kids, you know, in the capital, and we serve you know, around another 200 kids around the countryside. So it's been going well, but it's just like we need a few more angels and hands to kind of come with us and help us. Are they enthusiastic, the kids? Are they mostly girls, boys, a combination of the two? Combination of two. We have half and half, boys and girls. And they are very happy because through this program, they really find peace and understanding of how to live in a chaos country like Haiti. How many hours a week do they come to see you when you're there? They come to see us Monday to Friday for like eight hours a day. Wow, um, it's intensive. Intensive, yes. Nine to four for like a month, and we do a month and a half right now. What was Port-au-Prince like? When did you arrive in Port-au-Prince? I arrived in, in Port-au-Prince on June 28th. It was peaceful. It was, of course, you know, a lot of you know people running around trying to mind their business. But on July 7th, it was really chaotic. So what happened? How did the riots start? I was going to drop one of my co-workers and some of my students that I sometimes give a ride to. And it was about 4, 4.20, and suddenly I saw the street get very busy and people were running and they started to put tires and barricade around different streets. And suddenly somebody said, you know, we need to get, you know, home safe because, you know, they're starting a big riot and I don't think we're going to be able to make it back to the hotel where we were. So the place that I was is pretty much 10 to 15 minutes away from the hotel where I where I stayed and where I run the program. And we end up getting back into the hotel maybe an hour and 15 minutes later. And this is the riots that we see here. Now, what happened when you got back to the hotel? It took you an hour and a half. I guess it was a little scary. What happened? It was really scary because, you know, that really brought the memory of my father's, you know, tragedy that happened in 1991 in Haiti. So when we got back to the hotel, it was really relief, but also too very intense because my parents you know, and my family was looking out to know where, what I was doing in Haiti still, if I could get out ASAP. And I had also friends of mine who came to help me with the program. And I didn't know what to tell them because they were kind of worried. They weren't too scared, but they were worried. And I told them, do not be scared because if that thing is over by the few days coming, we will still stay in Haiti to do the program, which we did. But, you know, people were very worried because there were a lot of chaos. So tell me what you actually saw from the hotel room. You say chaos. What did you actually from say? The, I, well, from the street when I was driving back, there were a tire burning like you saw in the video. Right. And there were people running with, you know, barricade in their hand, trying to break into stores, trying to burn tires, trying to really throw things at buildings. And it was very, and they started to burn, you know, a few hotels around the heels of Port-au-Prince. So I was very much worried also about my hotel that I was staying in that they might come and burn it down. So we were pretty much like trying to stay put and trying to stay safe. But, you know, at the end of the night, we ended up sleeping late that night. And when I woke up the next day, it was still tense. We couldn't even go get food in the street because the hotel was pretty 
pretty much closed. There were no, you know, no way to kind of have no service because the people who work at the hotel couldn't come back to the hotel to serve anybody. So we were trying to get to the street to see if we can find food, but it was very tense. So we tried to stay next to the hotel more and try to eat what we had in the hotel. And after that, the next, the following two days, we went out and tried to get something to eat. Wow. So you were basically prisoner in the hotel. Pretty much. So you decided to teach the class anyway, and the riots were still going on. How did that go? The kids came because the riot happened on a Friday evening. So the kids came on Monday trying to have class, but the riot was still was still intense. So we just told them, you know, if it comes down on Tuesday, we'll start on Tuesday, which it did. Mm -hmm. And we started back on Tuesday. Oh. And we spent two more weeks in Haiti where we taught the classes. And thank God, there were still tensions and there were still worry about, you know, going to the street. But thank God the kids were, you know, coming in safe and we able to teach the classes. And after that, we're just trying to really, you know, pick up the pieces because a lot of the streets were very still barricaded. So it makes traffic was very bad for the kids to come to us. So even though we were very kind of like asking the kids to be there on time, so we couldn't send them back home because they were pretty much trying to get to the program back, you know, to dance. And what we're looking at here now is a burnt out building. I guess one of the buildings they burned down in the riots. This is oh. a supermarket somewhere in Delma, pretty much in Haiti. And it was pretty, burnt there down. Are a lot of other markets like this was burned down and businesses were burned down like that. This is all going on and you're teaching a class inside. When the music goes on and the kids are there and you're dancing, do you, do you get almost like a sense of you're in a cocoon and you don't even know what's going on outside? Or is there still a sense of fear that the building that I'm teaching the kids in can go up in flames? We kind of like teach a class and we try to really stay positive because of the kids, because the kids are, you know, pretty much looking for normalcy. So we cannot really kind of keep on creating the system of like, wow, you know, we're scared and we don't want you know, we don't know what to do, we don't know what So we try to really keep the kids in, in tuned and we try to let them know to stay right. safe. And we end up teaching the class peacefully. And also the class really give us a sense of normalcy. Because when you don't find peace, you have to create it. Right. Because as a teacher, as a passionate teacher, and as somebody who's been through trauma before, I did not want my kids in Haiti to suffer from the same thing that I suffered. So I try to really talk to them about how to stay safe and how we can just like dance together and hear the music and hear the drums and trying to be there for each other and support each other the way we can. And I think you hit on a, ver a really valid point about giving them a sense of normalcy that, you yeah. know, this class is still going on versus it's too dangerous to come, stay at home. And that would that would lead to more psychological, I think, damage. Pretty much so. Pretty much. So. The riots continued for how long? And there's a dead body there. Wow. It continued continued for like maybe two days and four, two or three days and four. And after that, you know, during the week that we were teaching there, people started to really kind of like, you know, go back to their businesses and the president of Haiti gave his speech and the prime minister was there. I ended up, you know, quitting or I think they, he was revoked. So, you know, the policy was still trying to really make people understand what's going on because it was, you know, a lot of things going on because people said, you know, it was the gas price that they put on that there is my kind of create this kind of chaos. But also people are living in very bad shape in Haiti still because you have, you know, 90% of the country who's living under poverty. So it is very hard yeah. for people to really move and to be able to eat whatever they want to eat. Did, did you feel at any time that your life was in danger, that you could have been killed? The day of the, yeah, you of were scared. the, day of the riot, yeah. I was in the street. I was very scared because people were smacking our cars. Because, you know, if you are in a, uh, in a car, people who's like in the riot feel like, you know, you are part of the problem. Because you're driving and you can move around and themselves, they are suffering and they cannot eat the same way that maybe you can. So it's kind of like it's very chaotic. Very now, chaotic. now, just a little background here on the riot. The Haitian government announced on Friday, July 6th, the prices were going to go up 38% for gasoline, 47% for diesel, and 51% for kerosene. Now, the price hikes were too much for most of the people to bear, which caused the riots. About 59% of Haitians make less than the equivalent of $2.41 a day. So if they're making $2.41 a day, how in the world would they be able to afford any of this, which is what caused the riots? And a total, uh, at least according to government officials, 
Nine people died that weekend in the riots. The prime minister resigned. You're there. Has that calmed the people down? Have the prices come down for the gas? What's going on now? It did kind of like, you know, calm people down because people felt like, you know, they had their voice heard. So that kind of really calmed people down a little bit. But still, the problem is still lingering. As you can hear, like just two days ago, there were huge other right? Thank God they didn't burn that much of places, but there were a huge manifestation in, in, of people in the street screaming for, you know, poverty and, you know, lack of uh, resources in Haiti. So it's still going on. So to me, I feel like I tried to really get the help that I bring to Haiti just like to really make those kids understand that they can become a leader also too and they can become productive despite of all this chaos that you see around of you. It's, it's amazing to me because the Haitians that I, I've never been to Haiti myself, but the Haitians that I meet here in America are all, for the most part, you know, I, don't, I hate to stereotype people, really smart, hardworking, intelligent, common-sense people. I don't understand why they can't get their country together. What do you think of the problem is? The problem is many levels. Because to me, when I get to Haiti, you see there are the politicians who's very hungry for, you know, for power and very hungry for money. And you have outside hands who's also there, hungry for money and hungry for control. And the poverty in Haiti become business for everybody to gain from it, but not for the mass population who's like suffering from it. So poverty become like, you know, a business. It's politicians being selfish for their own gain without really, and it's, and it's been forever there, I guess, right? For, for since the French left. And even the French were, French did it too also. French were worse. But, you know, they still, and they, they still do a lot of damage. You know, they have, you know, people from America, people from France, people from Canada, politicians who just, like, really feel like they want to get their hands on Haiti because they feel like Haiti is a gem. Haiti is a place where they can really make money anyway because even when Haiti is in deep poverty, people are still making millions of dollars in Haiti. They, people are still asking where the money is going. So nobody have any answer yet, but it's just like, we feel like, you know, Haiti needs a chance because this generation of new kids, they need a chance because they are very eager to learn. And to me, what I would like to see coming out of that is just for any politicians or anybody who's very hungry for Haiti, they really need to put Haiti in a better path so everybody can live peacefully and everybody can live productively. Because you have also a great bit of population who doesn't know how to read or write. So to me, I feel like it's time for us to really say enough is enough. Trump is ending TPS program for Haiti, temporary protected status mm -hmm. for Haitians. Uh, it's going to be lifted on July 22nd, 2019, as of now. That's the date that it ends. Uh, from your experience this summer, if all the Haitians in America have to go back to Haiti, what do you think is going to happen? Chaos. Chaos. Chaos, death, and, and more poverty. Because now I think they're really trying to get us and the point when Somalia was going very, very bad, you know, like with hunger, with poverty, and chaos. That's where they want to put Haiti. And to me, I feel like if you do that, to a lot of people who've been pretty much doing their business here in America, and who's been working so hard, getting a job, and trying to find any kind of job it is, dishwashing, you know, um, um, cleaning hospitals, cleaning, you know, older people here in America, and now for them to go back to Haiti and not even knowing where they're going to find a job, you have people are dying now in Haiti. People are being picked up by trash truck when they died in Haiti, where there is no morgue who can come and pick them up to bring them like to a proper burial. So to me, I feel like Haiti, I don't know, I'm not trying to publicize the worst of Haiti because Haiti have also its best part because Haiti have a lot of beautiful places that you can go and relax. It's just like, to me, I feel the politics is too wrong and it is very unfair for people to really use mm -hmm. other human beings to make profit like this. And to me, I, I feel like it's time. It's time for us to do better. Sure, I understand. And, you know, it's sad. It's very sad there. And I don't know if there's one solution to the problem. I, I, you know, it's an intra intractable problem. You plan on going back next summer after all the trauma and uh, a near-death experience you had this summer? I'm going back next week. You're going back next week? All right, good for I'm you. I'm going back next week for five days. Good for you. Because, you know, November is a celebration. There's a lot right. of the dead in Haiti, and I have to do my program again next summer in Haiti. So to me, I feel like if we 
there are a lot of other great institutions who's doing a lot of good things in Haiti also do at the same time that I'm telling you that because you have people who really mean good in Haiti. Now you posted a lot on your Facebook page when all of this was happening. What was the reaction on Facebook? A lot of people said, you know, come back home. But also a few of friends of mine who knows my passion, they just, you know, said to me, Jean, stay safe and what try to really, you know, come back safe to us, but you know, do your thing and try to help those kids to stay to stay focused. Jean, if more people in Haiti were like you, I think the country would be okay. Here you are putting your life at risk, your time, your energy, your money, your expertise to help children there. And if more people in Haiti did what you did, the country would be on a better track. So good for you. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your experiences with us. And I'm sure we'll speak again soon. Thank you so much, Brad, for giving me the platform to be able to express that. Yeah. I truly appreciate that. And I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you again. Appreciate it. <laughs>